Welcome from California today, my friend, Pastor Randy Powell, as he ministers the Word of God. Oh, you may be seated. Wow. Well, greetings from fellow brothers and sisters in Southern California to our brothers and sisters in Yakima. Glory. This is fun. I have the opportunity to speak to you on something that I have been teaching on for 25 plus years. It is Jerusalem Walls. It's part, probably going to cover some of the things you guys have been talking about, some of the things you will be talking as you do, Nehemiah. I may duplicate some of it, but it's still worth hearing. So here we go with it. Jerusalem Walls. Now, I'm a therapist, psychotherapist, and a minister, but I am a pastor who happens to do therapy and coaching. That's what I do. So Jerusalem Walls is going to be from both points of view. I'm going to talk about it in a historical understanding, and then I'm going to talk how does it apply to us in psychological, relational meanings. Okay, Jerusalem has multiple levels. The walls were one level. They were there to keep out the enemy. You then have inside the walls, you have a marketplace. Then inside that, you have the outer courts of the temple. That's where Jesus knocked the money changers out of the way. Then you have inside that, you have the temple, the sanctuary. Each level you go, it's more and more sacred. More and more holy. We'll get into that more in a minute. And then the final level is the Holy of Holies, the most sacred area. That's the area where the priest went in with the rope tied around their ankle and two others helped him in. And if it wasn't the right priest, he was killed. That's pretty sacred ground. Now we're going to go into that more in a minute, but I want to sit here first and look around and say, look at this building. Look at the walls. Isn't it a beautiful, fun building? What does this building do? This building has walls that protect you from the weather. And your weather is different than my weather. Our weather goes from the cold of 62, 64 to the hot of 85. And if it gets above that or below that, we're freezing or we're overheated. So your walls protect you against that. They have great walls, but if it only had walls, it would be a prison. So we don't have just walls, we have doors. So people can come in and out. This is a place where people are meant to come in. This is a place that is meant to be populated. But you don't live here. You don't live here. You go outside and take what is given here out to the world. You take what you learn of being a child of God out to the world and become God's representative to say, this building with its protections also feeds. It's a safe place. And we often call these sanctuaries. Now we've lost the meaning of sanctuary. We, we don't always have it defined well. So I'm going to give a, a definition, and then we're going to look at some scripture that also gives us a better definition of a sanctuary. But first off, a sanctuary is a place of refuge, a place of safety, a sacred place, a haven. It is set apart from the irreverent. Think about that for a second. It's set apart from the irreverent. It is a place of great respect, a sacred place. 
So a sanctuary means it's a place I come into with awe and respect, and I come in there realizing the sacredness of it. But it's still a building. How can a building be sacred? It's just a building. Ah, let's look at Exodus 25.8 for a second. God had taken Israel out of Egypt. They had been in exile. They had been slaves. And God was telling Moses how to build Israel back up, how to take care of them properly, and how to worship him. And in one verse, we could look through all of it, but in one verse of this exodus out of Egypt into the promised land, out of it was this. God told Moses to have the people make a sanctuary for me, for God. So a sanctuary is sacred, but it's for God. This is for God. When you stop to think about the creator of the world and the universe, almighty God inhabits this place because it has been consecrated to him. It has been given to him. It has said, this is yours. And we have the opportunity to walk in to a sanctuary. I'm, I don't know about you, but that, that, that astounds me. <laughs> that, that overwhelms me at some level to think on the fact that God is actually available in there and inhabits a sanctuary because it was given to him. Now, Nehemiah, which you've been reading on, had to come back and had to build up Jerusalem. Now, Moses is later, and he's bringing him back out of Egypt, but Jerusalem was destroyed. Jerusalem was destroyed by Babylon. And it was, the gates were destroyed, Jerusalem was destroyed, it was not safe to be in. And Nehemiah's looking at this, and he's the cupbearer for Artaxerxes, the king of Persia, that is now Iran, Persia. They had been in prison and basically owned for years because what happened when Babylon came and destroyed Jerusalem they took the, the people and dispersed them throughout the lands. It was their way, whenever they conquered, was to take people and move them to other countries that they didn't have the same culture. Have you ever been moved to a country or an area that doesn't have your culture? It's uncomfortable. You feel alone. You feel left out. It's not good. We're here under one culture. Oh, we have other cultures, obviously. I'm, I'm gringo, right? And we've joked on what that is. And I've been to many Mexican restaurants with these guys, and I'm enjoying it and loving it. That's one culture. But we have a common culture here. And that's why brothers and sisters from Southern California send their greetings to the brothers and sisters of Yakima. We have one culture, and it's offered unto God. We give and say, come inhabit the sanctuary. So Nehemiah realizes this. He knows that they've been dispersed. He knows it's, it's going on, and he's a cupbearer. He doesn't have his own free will to move around. He has to ask permission. He is alone there at some level, and some of the people who were dispersed, a brother and others, came and visited him. And when they did, they talked about how severe it was in Jerusalem. Nehemiah, we read, as he was talking to these people about Jerusalem in Nehemiah 11.3, they said to me, to Nehemiah, those who survived the exile, 
the disbursement, the separation out, the movement to where you're not feeling with your people, your family, your loved ones. You're spread to places you don't know the language, the food. You don't know what you're supposed to do. Those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. They are hurting. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. How many of you have been with a family member or heard of a family member that's been, their gates have been burned? They've been hurt. Now I'm going to take this a little bit out of the biblical to my psychological area that I also run. How many have had their Jerusalem destroyed by a parent? Molestation, abuse, a partner in life that beat them, yelled at them, a teacher that didn't believe in you and talked badly about you. How many have been in a place where you have been destroyed and ran over in your city, your being, who you are, has been said to be poor. You're no good. You've been treated that way by your boss. Everyone could raise their hand because all of us have been attacked. All of us. We need to rebuild. But before we rebuild, before that went on, Nehemiah in verse 4 says, when I heard these things, I sat down and wept. Now, this always reminds me of Jesus when he wept. Jesus wept. I think there's times we don't know how to sit with one another and just weep. Just cry with one another. Tell our stories to one another. To hear our stories. To hear what we've gone through. To hear how our Jerusalem's walls have been destroyed. Our temple has been pounded on. Our gates have been burned. How someone has told me, I'm no good. I'm a horrible person. I've had lies and deception foisted, put upon me throughout my career. Anyone who's a leader will have that. My point is we should cry and weep with each other. If you have been harmed by a family member, if you have been abused, if you have gone through tough times, if a boss has been a jerk, if a teacher didn't care about you, if a coach yelled at you, which I had many coaches yelling at me, <laughs> probably deserve some of it, it is sometimes attacking our walls and knocking them down. You need someone that will weep with you. Join with you and sit and cry with you. Jesus wept before he raised Lazarus from the tomb. So here we have Nehemiah that's saying, I sat down and wept. He went to the king, Artaxerxes, and said to him, I want to go to my brothers. I want to go to my sisters. I want to go build this land back up. I want to build the walls and, and, and the temple. I want to build this up so there's a sanctuary for my people to be in to serve their God, to serve my God. And Artaxerxes said, go. Take what you need to make this happen. Now, he couldn't do it alone. I do not know anyone that can build their Jerusalem walls, their own self, their being, cannot, can build it alone. He couldn't do it alone. We know that because in Nehemiah 2.17, we read, Then I said to him, this is Nehemiah talking to the people, to the remnants that are there, to the ones who were in Jerusalem. He said to them, You see the trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins, and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, and we will no longer be in disgrace. We all need our walls built. Now, in psychology, it's really pretty funny because we call the walls boundaries. How many of you have ever read about boundaries? Yes, 
Some of you, good. Boundaries are set to protect. We put boundaries up to say, don't cross this without permission because you could hurt me. A boundary is meant to say, ah, you're getting into an area that could be damaging to me. The walls of Jerusalem were up to say, we don't want someone coming in that isn't safe. They had gates so everyone could go in. But the gates were guarded. Every gate had a guard. Now, I won't go through all the guards at each of the gate, but I'm going to go through the front gate. And the main gate was built on a ramp, on a, uh, an incline, on purpose, with rocks that are little tiny rocks that are shale-like rocks, so that any armies trying to get up would be at a great disadvantage because they're sliding. It was a way to protect. And then when you went in, you had to prove you had a reason for being in Jerusalem. So there is an evaluation. Is the, these, the people coming into the main gate, are they safe? How many of you have asked the friends, the people you hang with, are they safe? Do they belong within my environment? Now, we're reaching out and giving testimony. We're sharing the gospel to people. So not everyone is safe. But sometimes that's because we go outside of our safe zone, of our Jerusalem, and go to others and preach the gospel. Tell the truth. Tell the good news that Jesus Christ died for us. That God loves us. Okay? We're going outside these walls to present the gospel. But inside my walls, my area, I need to evaluate who is safe. And unfortunately, sometimes the ones that aren't safe are parents, siblings. Probably the thing that should break our heart the most is it's someone that should be protecting, caring for us, loving us, is the one that actually did the damage. And we need that healed because our gates are destroyed. We need to build the walls back up, the boundaries back up. Now, there are a lot of people allowed into the city that don't live there for a variety of reasons. And one of the reasons is because they have a marketplace. Now, why does Jerusalem have a marketplace? Because they cannot produce everything they need from within the city. So they have goods brought in. So there are people that are allowed into their city that are trading and bartering. Now, I don't know if you've heard the term transactional relationship. How many have heard that term, transactional? Some of you, good. Transactional is meaning that I'm going to give you something and you're going to give me something in return. That's not agape love. That's transactional. And a lot of our relationships are transactional. And that's fine if I'm buying a goods. Marketplace is a transactional relationship. It's giving and getting something in return. Now, at the next level we go, which is the outer courts of the temple and the homes, but I'm not going to talk about the homes where they're living. I'm going to talk about the outer courts. There, it's not transactional anymore, which is why Jesus got angry at the outer courts because they had made that into a transactional relationship. Find the best dove. Find the best sheep. Find the cleanest. They were making money on it. The house of God was being desecrated, disrespected. You house God. The Holy Spirit is with you. We do not desecrate ourselves, nor should we let someone else desecrate us. Okay, there's a lot there. I'm not going into the full depth. I'm explaining that we are a child of God. We are his masterpiece made by him. He is proud of who we are. He made us well. He loves us. He's redeemed us. We have value. And if someone doesn't treat me with value, they're basically not treating God with value. Samuel, little side note, but Samuel, who was the prophet for Israel for years, he was the word, he was the one that got the word from God, spoke to God, and then went to Israel and told them what, what was going on and gave them a word. At one point, Israel was influenced by the 
area and the people. And they wanted a king. And so they argued with Samuel and they said, we want a king. Here's why. And Samuel went to God and said, they want a king. And God said, no, they don't. The king will lord it over them, will abuse them, went on and on why they shouldn't have a king. And Samuel went back to the people, went back and forth with this argument. And on the final time when he went to God, he said, God, they want a king. They are rejecting me. And God goes, oh, Samuel, no, 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 they're not. You, you represent me, Samuel. So they are rejecting me. We are his representatives. You will be attacked. Jesus made it real clear. It's going to happen. But they're rejecting God. And that I mean at every level that you live. Whether it's ethnically, culturally, a work, an environment, a family, someone is rejecting you, but it is a lie. God loves us and made us and did not say oops when he made us. He said it is good. So as we know that, we walk with boldness as we walk in to the outer courts of the temple. As we enter our own outer courts, we enter with confidence that we are children of God with great value. And we need to treat ourselves with that respect as we treat each other with that type of respect. I know when my son watches over and cares for my daughter, and my daughter cares for my son, that brings me phenomenal joy. That brings me great joy. When brothers and sisters take care of each other and care for one another, protect one another, that brings great joy to the Father. So how are we showing respect to each other and to ourselves? That's the outer courts. Now you walk into the sanctuary, the temple itself. When you did, you walked in and you went by a priest that was at the gates that said, let me check you and see if you're clean and can enter into the temple. Let me check to see if your offering is right. Now, what's fun about this is they wanted to make sure you had a, a really good dove and a really good lamb that was ble without blemish, right? So you were being judged as you went in. Guess what? We're not judged because we have a perfect lamb. <laughs> All we have to do is accept the lamb, the perfect lamb. And the priest guarding the temple says, oh, no, no, you come on in. Let me open the doors. You've got the offering. It's a perfect offering. So we enter the temple. We enter the sanctuary. We enter our own sanctuary because what's also gone on is in those times, the people couldn't talk directly to God. They had to go through a priest. That's why Samuel was there and others. But see, Jesus said, no, no, no. I'll be your high priest in heaven. I'll, I'll be there. You have a direct access. <laughs> How cool is that? We have a freedom to enter the temple because we have a perfect offering. We have a perfect priest in heaven that's talking to us, so we have direct access to God. Isn't that cool? Amen. I mean, that's exciting. That's everyone here has that. It's available. The inner courts, when you get there to the, to the holy place, to the temple, when you get in there, if someone spit or some way did something sacrilegious on the ground, they would be taken outside the city and often stoned. But see, there's a little change now. Still sacred area. We've given it to God, remember? This is his sanctuary. We have been given to God. We are his sanctuary. But there's a little difference. I'm a story. I was in the army years ago. Back in just a little bit after when you were born, I was drafted to go in the army. It was when they still had the draft. I spent six years in reserves. 
I was a chaplain's assistant. Now, chaplain's assistants, what they do is they service all faiths. So you have to learn how to support a chaplain, no matter what faith they are. So for some of you, you will understand this very clearly. Some of you may not. But we were being trained by a Catholic priest who said, would you please, at the end of our service, a Catholic service, please run back and grab the holy water. Now, this is blessed water. Many of you may know this. It's blessed water. It's sacred water. It's to be treated with respect. So they say, go grab the water and bring it to us as soon as you can. Because sometimes the very next service in the same building, because the chapels were used by all different faiths, the same building, the next service may be a Baptist service or a Methodist service, and some of those soldiers would put their cigarettes out in the holy water because they didn't know what it was. And the Catholic priest said, we'd get it, see some fighting, so <laughs> please get the holy water. Now, I'm not going down this route over here. I'm just going to allude to it. Here it comes. Often in our marriages and our relationships, we put out with good intentions a cigarette that we're trying to put out. We put it out in someone else's holy water into their sacred area. We didn't know that. We were trying to do something right. But we dishonored them. Relationship demands discussion, openness, talking. Relationship demands looking at how someone's story developed so that they had that sacred water, so that you could see the heart of the other person putting out the cigarettes in the water. They weren't trying to be disrespectful. They actually were trying to be respectful. Now, we could go on that with the marriage issues and relationship issues for a long time, but I'm going to leave it over there to come back to us that we all need to build our walls. We need to build boundaries. We need to have transactional relationships. Some transactional relationships are those we meet at the store, at our work. There's an interaction. But even in our transactional relationships, marketplace people that we meet, we can witness to them. We can give them testimony. We can love on them. We can still show them respect because they are children of God. They have value. They have value. Now, you also have to recognize the layers. Who do you allow in to your different layers? We'll go one more layer, and then I'm going to give you an example of Jesus on these layers and how he used them. And, and, and this is my view. I'm not trying to say it's theologically sound. It's a metaphor. It's meant to help just like parables that Jesus gave. It's meant to help you understand how to be healthy, how to treat yourself with respect and others. But the final one was Holy of Holies. The Holy of Holies, where the priest went in with the rope tied around their ankle. Two other priests prepared that priest to go in. And they went in, and they would go in and they would give a sacrifice to God to get a word from God to give to all of Israel. What do you think the emotion was of the priest with a rope tied around their ankle going in? Say it again. Fear, uncertainty, deep introspection. May I be the right one? <laughs> May I not get in trouble going in? May I not die? I hope I'm, I've, I've done right. If they have any respect for God, that's what they have. Same thing for us when we do introspection. One of my, my greatest pleasures is I get to enter people's holy of holies with them. I get to prepare them as they go in and look at themselves honestly and openly. It is a phenomenal honor to walk there with them as they talk with God, as God talks with them and gives them a message. And they get to look at themselves and be free to come back out with a word from God. That's good therapy. That's good relationship with God. That's good Christian living. That's good stuff. So the Holy of Holies. When that 
person, the priest, exits out, they are excited. They are happy. They have a word for, from God. How can you not be excited if you, when you have a word from God? You have to be excited. There has to be a joy, a confidence. When any of us enter our Holy of Holies to face God, and we are talking through the Holy Spirit with Jesus, we're talking, and we're talking with God and having a relationship with God, we should be exiting with confidence and boldness. But it's also scary. And so a lot of people just go to the temple, the outer courts, maybe even just the marketplace, maybe even just the inner courts. Maybe just one of those three levels is all they go, and they don't go to the holy holies because that's scary. But it's there that we get completely revitalized. Vitality, fullness, healing, wholeness. Now, I'm going to give you this as a as an understanding only. And that's that Jesus, as I look at his life, I see that he, in his holy of holies, he had two people that were his closest people. He had John the beloved and he had Peter. He had two. Jesus can allow two in. That's about all he could handle to have that type of depth of intimacy, closeness. We are made to have only a couple people truly enter our, our Holy of Holies on a regular basis. It, it, you can't let everyone into your Holy of Holies. And, and frankly, that's when we've been abused. That's when we've been in situations where others have demanded and forced their way in. And when they have, they have knocked the walls down all the way to the Holy of Holies and destroyed our so total being. And we are in disrespect and disrepair and we are hurting. And we need to come back and look at our Holy of Holies and look at who we are and build that back properly. And then Jesus had 12. We call them the apostles. That were people that, those were the ones that got into the temple, the sanctuary, 12. The reality is we cannot have a deep, intimate relationship with more than about 12 people. I feel real bad because I meet lots of people and I love them to death. I see God's creation. It's so fun to get to know them and see their, and hear their story and get close. But I cannot maintain a relationship of a temple-type level, of a sanctuary level with more than about 12 people to really understand them and pray for them and hear their hurts and pains and share mine with them and have this interactive process. About 12 is all any of us can handle at that deep, sacred level. But we often try to have it with more and, or with none. We hide. Then... The outer courts. Jesus had hundreds. Hundreds that were called disciples that followed him. We can have hundreds that are in still sacred area. Still important areas. Still interactive. But they're not the temple, the sanctuary, nor the Holy of Holies. And then outside that in the marketplace, transactional, relational, give and take. Thousands upon thousands. And then Jesus said, I didn't come for all. I came for my people. Others will go outside the walls and see. If someone uh, comes for a minute and we have music, I'm, I want you to take time to just think, you, you are a sanctuary. You are a moving sanctuary. You have been given to God for a purpose. We have honored this place. This is only walls and doors and whatever, but it is sacred territory because it has been given to God. I have chosen to give myself to God. It is a sacred territory. It is a sacred territory. Think on that. Yesterday, I talked a little bit on masterpieces, that you are made by God. You are a masterpiece. We may be marred. We may be scarred. We may even be painted upon, because masterpieces are sometimes harmed. But that doesn't change the value. It's a masterpiece. And it can be restored. 
And that's what we do. We get to restore the masterpiece. We get to restore Jerusalem. We, and it takes a team. No one person restores Jerusalem. Read Nehemiah. It took a team. We need each other to restore ourselves and restore the building of safety, sacred area for people to come in, and they need to come in whether they're marred, scarred, or painted on, whether they're damaged or not. They need to come in so they can feel the blessing, the love, the anointing, the sacredness, the safety, the comfort, the respect that we all have so they can feel it through us what God has given to each of us. And we often need that this sacred time to restore our souls, to restore ourselves. We've been marred, scarred, and painted on throughout the week. Someone has thrown pain on me. Someone has stabbed me. Someone has yelled at me. Someone has cut me off from the freeway. Not that severe, but sometimes I take it that way. How do we get restored? That's what this is, a sanctuary for restoration and healing.